Hello everyone and welcome to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Gabriel Martin and I'm delighted to be back with you for another episode having been in New Zealand for a few weeks. I'm sending my special thanks to Carolyn Ward for subbing for me in my absence. Now if you're joining for the first time, a very warm welcome. It's great to have you with us and so thanks for coming along. For those of you who don't know, Open Your Eyes to the Universe is a series of contemporary talks, conversations, open-eyed meditations, and interviews with people who inspire and uplift others by sharing their wisdom, their insights, and experiences. Last month on Universe, Carolyn was in conversation with Marie Lissette Dirks from the Netherlands and Simone Erst from Germany, and they were discussing a life beyond belief, sharing their personal experiences of navigating the many transitions on a spiritual journey towards spiritual maturity. Well, tonight we're in the company of Dr. Raksha Balbadur to discuss a new approach to stress management, that being love versus force. Dr. Raksha is a palliative care physician and practices in South Africa. Now look, she meditates daily and working a demanding job in a calm and compassionate way is key to her success in many contexts. But let me explain a little bit further. Raksha graduated in 2001 with a MBCHB honours at the University of Cape Town. And after her graduation, she worked in hospitals in Africa, across the UK, Northern Wales, Northern Ireland, and in India. And she is now in private practice as a palliative care physician in South Africa. Her voluntary work is equally impressive and reflects a very deep level of compassion. In 2006, she founded and coordinates the activities of a non-profit organization called Values and Healthcare Association of South Africa. She regularly facilitates on a voluntary basis, a Care for the Carrier Experiential Professional Development Program. And that's a program that supports healthcare workers across South Africa. Raksha is acutely aware of the gradual impact stresses in the field of healthcare oppose upon healthcare workers, personally and in teams. And she sees the values in healthcare program as an effective tool for healthcare professionals to experience greater fulfillment and love for their chosen profession whilst working under extremely stressful conditions, and even more so within the COVID context. Raksha is part of a team that developed and delivers the Living with Dignity and Hope modular program. She did this in 2011. It's an experiential support program created to support healing and well-being for people living with cancer, HIV AIDS, and other life-threatening diseases. In addition, Raksha regularly facilitates Living Your Spirits residential retreats for healthcare professionals on the Hibiscus Coast in Cape Town, here in Australia, and in Johannesburg. So tonight, she's taking a fresh approach to managing and overcoming stress by exploring love versus force. Now, viewers, as always, we welcome your questions. Thanks to those who've sent them in already. If you have access to the chat box, then please feel free to write your questions and, um, and we'll ask them to her during the Q&A session. Raksha, um, firstly, I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to you and all healthcare workers for the infinite attention and tireless service um, healthcare workers have demonstrated across our globe as we've managed the COVID pandemic. And I know that you have a vision that if healthcare professionals are supported, the entire world is supported because the quality of care is greatly improved. And, um, and I'm sure that the voluntary facilitation work you do in addition to your professional practice provides huge support to healthcare workers. So our biggest thanks to you and from all our viewers as well. Um, look, you were last in Australia in 2013 when you facilitated a residential retreats for healthcare professionals and that was entitled Lifting Your Spirits. Well, it's lovely to have you back here again, albeit online. So welcome back to the New Zealand and Australia region, which... Uh, down here, we often refer to as down under. So thank you, Gabrielle. And good evening to all of you down there in Oz. And it's a wonderful morning here, a cool morning in Durban, South Africa. And so thank you for having me uh, and this opportunity to be with all of you this evening. 
So when thinking about this topic, I know um, when Gabrielle asked me which topic would I like to pursue, and when I asked a colleague, you know, what would be appropriate at this current time, and, um, you know, this colleague mentioned that overcoming stress is very relevant. And then I just pondered about how I had personally dealt with stress, and the antidote for me, the natural antidote, has always been love and courage. And I noted that when I try and force things, it always made the stress worse. It paralyzed me to such an extent that I was quite non-functional and dysfunctional. And so today, let's explore this wonderful topic of overcoming stress and love versus force. And thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, listening to that appreciation for healthcare workers, uh, definitely I feel they do work with that power of love and that is what keeps them going through this very challenging time uh, in, in our current world context. So just to begin, I would like to begin the session with a, a, a relaxation so we can all become present. I know it's the end of a Saturday for you, it's the beginning of a Saturday for me. And so I'll invite you now just to become relaxed in your seats as I guide you through a little relaxation and reflection. So looking at the beautiful picture before me, I just invite you all to become totally relaxed. It may have been a long day, a long week. And for the next hour and a half, let me just explore this topic of overcoming stress. But in this moment, let me become absolutely relaxed. I take my mind to the space on the video before me, it is so peaceful, so tranquil. I can almost feel the warmth of the sun and the peace and the silence of this place. And as I'm seated here, if there's any tiredness or weariness, any pain or discomfort in this body, I allow it to gently drip down my body, into my feet, into the earth beneath me. And scanning my body, if any muscle is in tension, I just invite it to become completely relaxed. And I remind myself, just like the space that I see before me, I am peace. And I hold this feeling as it ripples into my body. I am peace. And as I settle into this moment, I remind myself, I am love. Thank you. So thank you all. I was just remembering, you know, my first experience of using the power of love in overcoming stress. It must have been 20 years ago. Um, you know, I was a young um, student at the University of Cape Town and uh, the professor had asked me to uh, deliver a speech to a, a wide audience of about three to 400 academics on a particular course that was very dear to my heart. And naturally, I was quite stressed and afraid. 
And then I decided at that moment, you know, after preparing adequately, that this topic is so close to my heart, and yet I am ruining it with these, with these feelings of stress. And so I just connected to that feeling of love as I spoke uh, the, you know, whatever I had to share. And uh, it was a beautiful experience and it left an indelible impression on the audience such that after the sharing, uh, two of the professors themselves, you know, had come up and uh, expressed their congratulations for the sharing. And so for me, this was a simple yet powerful experience of how love can overcome stress and can beat the many forces of self-doubt and insecurity that one may feel. So let us explore now and delve into the what, how, and why of stress and love. And I'll approach it from a scientific, medical, personal, and a human approach. So first of all, what is stress? And uh, we may have heard the many definitions of stress. And so a physical, mental, emotional, cultural, or existential strain or tension and physical, uh, often the, uh, that which is shared by many is that there's no time, there's no energy, no space, and there's so many roles and responsibilities that need to be fulfilled. And mental strain, the fluctuating self-worth and confidence based on how perfectly my role is executed in the eyes of myself and others and trying to be perfect and control everything. I can do it, I can't do it, I'm capable, I'm not capable. So that mental strain, the emotional strain from, from trying to meet the expectations of others and also cultural strain, trying to fulfill, you know, the many cultural pressures and the existential strain or tension of feeling a loss of purpose or meaning in life. And so all of this contributes to the strain or tension and results in a condition of feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands ex exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. And so how does stress make you feel? Not too good, does it? You know, so very tense, anxious, apprehensive, trapped, stuck, paralyzed, discontented, worried, doubtful, tired, impatient, irritable, reactive, critical, angry, small, stunted, afraid, inadequate, guilty. So just reading all of that, you know, makes one feel very small. And so really stress is not a healthy experience and, uh, and accordingly can create a lot of um, bodily uh, disease from that inner disease. So from, you know, difficulties concentrating, anxiety, depression, irritability, mood changes, mind fog, insomnia, to uh, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So we know that when we experience a stress or a danger, the body naturally secretes adrenaline and cortisol. And these two hormones are essential to respond to a danger. But in current day, every scene or situation is perceived as a danger and beyond my capability. And so the adrenaline and cortisol is being pumped out tirelessly into this body. And the effect of these two hormones is the many vast diseases that is projected on the screen uh, here. And so increased risk of heart attack and stroke, increased inflammation, tension, aches, pains, muscle tightness, um, indigestion, nutrient absorption is affected, diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, bloating, pain, discomfort, hair loss, brittle nails, dry skin, acne, delayed tissue repair, 
a decreased immune function, lowered immune defenses, and the list can go on and on. And these are only some of them that have been listed on uh, this diagram. And so one can really appreciate that stress has a detrimental effect on the body. And so we've looked at the what is stress, stress and how does it make me feel, but why do we feel stressed? And uh, when I uh, reflect on the scientific formula for stress, stress actually is equal to force over area. And so when there is a higher demand or greater force that I experience on myself, then the stress is exemplified. And these forces come in especially two forms. And the first is the many, many external changes or challenges in the world uh, that increase the force or demand on the self. And definitely, you know, now the pace of major life events is at such, uh, you know, is so rapid. So from, um, you know, loss of job, a moving house to, um, you know, family uh, difficulties to bodily difficulties. So the external change and challenges increases the demands uh, and thus the stress. And this comes in forms of major life events, situations or circumstances, relationships, and the many, many changes in the world. And when we experience something new or an unexpected that threatens our sense of self, there is the experience of stress. And when we feel we have little control over people, situations, circumstances, or events, then there is the feeling of stress. And if you look at that image in the center of the screen, you know, that is how one often feels, hey, um, and, and uh, that feeling of there's so many pressures being, um, you know, thrust upon me. And whilst there may be these external uh, challenges and, um, and these may be the order of the day, yet it is how we perceive the problem and our coping abilities that matter. And yet many of us have many stressful mindsets that exacerbate the demands on the self. So if you look at that screen on the right hand side, you will see that there's also many stressful mindsets that, that increase the demand. So whilst I may be going through a lot of physical changes, uh, when I have mindsets you know, that are stressful, they exacerbate the force on the self. And the stressful mindsets are wanting to control what I cannot, fear of failure, feelings of inadequacy, low self-esteem, expectations, it should, they should, and perfectionism, inflexibility, I have to, I must, I should. And so these external changes and challenges, you know, increase the demands on the self and create greater stress. And stress is not a natural state of being, but the experience of great demands on the self. I was just thinking about a patient, uh, you know, that I had been working with, and she was very hopeful and optimistic, trying her best with the chemotherapy and, uh, and you know, reading and exploring deeply and maintaining a very powerful, positive attitude. But occasionally, she would be overcome with uh, very low thoughts, very depressive thoughts, uh, very low self-esteem. And in her exploration of herself, she started to look at these many cycles in her life. And she could see how, you know, uh, it had begun quite early on in, in her childhood constantly being put down as a child. And from the tender age of 
17, having two jobs to look after her family, her parents and her siblings, and yet always being told that she was not good enough, um, and that feeling of physical, emotional, mental abuse uh, that continued from childhood and wanting to please and wanting to be uh, the good child. She persevered to continue to fulfill all physical responsibilities, but her wound was deeper and deeper as she continued to feel inadequate. And so, in our last conversation, uh, you know, she decided to break the cycle and begin to value herself and appreciate all that she had achieved and how she had continued to, um, to, to move beyond all uh, the difficulties of childhood and create such an amazing life for herself and her family. And so with that, she then started to heal and be more positive and powerful and continues to approach her diagnosis with stage four cancer with optimism and hope. And so like the iceberg, no matter how much she pushed in a certain direction uh, on the surface, you know, and achieved success in her personal and professional life, her limiting beliefs uh, persisted to sail her uh, in the opposite direction to self-destruction. But as she contemplated and decided to finish those stressful mindsets, it helped her deal with that stress. And so like that, you know, there may be physical challenges, but what are the mindsets that I am holding that is increasing the force, the tension, the stress, the pressure on the self? And now let us look at the energy of love. And according to the Oxford and Cambridge um, definition, love encompasses a range of strong and positive emotional and mental states from the most sublime virtue or good habit, the deepest interpersonal affection to the simplest pleasure. But for me, love is a natural energy of the spirit or being an expansive, powerful energy that's inherent and eternal and permanently part of me. An energy that is light in nature and dispels difficulty and fear. And I always love this, the saying that love is labor lost and that the energy of love makes everything easy. And so what a contrast to the word stress, love and overflowing, expansive, powerful energy, inherent, eternal, a natural energy of the spirit, permanently part of me, and an energy that is light in nature, and dispels all fear, and makes everything easy. And so how does love make you feel? Think about it for yourself. How do you feel when you feel loved or when you share love? And one feels open-minded, expansive, calm, peaceful, content, accepting, trusting, comfortable, authentic, like I belong, supported, interconnected, powerful, the impossible becomes possible. I feel natural, uplifted, empowered, complete, and secure. Isn't that just such a wonderful feeling? So that's how love makes you feel. And so why does love decrease stress? Because as we said, according to that scientific formula, stress equals force over area. And love is that denominator in that formula. Love increases the area and so decreases the stress. And so as I express love, as I am love, this expansive, powerful, innate consciousness of love is an internal resource that increases area and capacity and decreases stress. 
And so that is why in that earlier example I had given you of, of um, you know, um, my experience giving a lecture and yet being very scared, as I tapped into this expansive, powerful, innate consciousness of love, it was the resource that increased the area and capacity and decreased the stress. And so if you look at that diagram on the screen before you, as I hold thoughts of love, it then creates an awareness of possibility, open-mindedness, all those many, many beautiful words we had in the previous slide. You know, it creates such a powerful energy within. And that awareness then spills into my feelings. And those feelings, those expansive feelings create attitudes that are wholesome and uplifting and a vision that is optimistic and powerful, a vibration that is clean and healing and actions that are wholesome and it creates atmospheres and the world. So in that example where I spoke from my heart, uh, one could see how there was a lot of anxiety, you know, I will not be able to do it properly, I'm not good enough, but the thoughts of love then permeated through the self into the atmosphere and created a good successful result. And I know Maya Angelou says, people may never remember what you said or what you did, but they will remember how they felt when they were around you. And so definitely the energy of love touches hearts and minds more than words can. And so living from inside out with love then permeates and brings balance to all domains of the self to the body, such that I'm more respectful and grateful to this precious body that helps me play my part in this drama of life. And I'm kind and inspiring to my mind. In relationships, I flow and I grow. And with wealth, there's always abundance. And in spirituality, uh, there's meaning and purpose in my life. And so living from inside out, using that inner resource, that powerful, expansive resource of love, then uh, helps reduce the experience of stress. And I done my master's thesis on uh, dignity in the dying. And if you look at this slide, when one is going through a terminal illness, um, you know, one is subjected to what a patient described as outside attack on a biological level with the body failing, psychological level where uh, you are coming to balance with all your mindsets in a very short time period, trying to come to balance with all your relationships and your spirituality and your belief. And the result of this uh, qualitative study was that those who were subjected to this outside attack, but accepted and let go and tuned into the core experience of their intrinsic dignity and worth. And when they affirmed this and was firmly rooted in this, uh, that they are dignity, they have a right to dignity, and no matter how they see themselves and how others see them, they have that right to dignity. Then accordingly, these individuals came to peace in all domains of their life, in all domains of the human being. So they came to peace with their biological uh, experience, with their psychological uh, mindsets, in their social circumstances and relationships, culturally and spiritually. And so I was just thinking an example is, is uh, you know, a patient with brain cancer that I had met 
And when I walked into his home for the first time, there he was, a young 30 plus year old man who had fought cancer ferociously with deep courage for 10 years. And uh, when I met him, he was angry and barely, barely able to speak. And, and as I did dignity therapy with him and also did a guided imagery on the untouchable energy, uh, the untouchable spirit, uh, he, something happened such that when I visited the next day, there he was walking when the previous time he was bed bound, barely whispering his five-year-old son, you know, just curled up in the corner of the lounge, so scared, uh, being rejected by his dad. And as, as he uh, had experienced, uh, you know, the experience of who he really was, and develop that inner self-worth, uh, within a week there was a shift actually within the day such that when I walked into his home the next time there he was walking and screaming and I said what happened? He said it's that thing you did with me. It showed me you know um, that all the rest was just nonsense and uh, and so he used bigger words than that <laughs> and, and you know and uh, and he, he developed that self-love for who he really is uh, you know and and began to open up again because he felt led down by himself that he couldn't fight this cancer anymore and he started rejecting his wife his son life and, uh, and just knowing that he was more than that mortal body. Uh, and he, as he developed that self-love, that self-love permeated into his relationships, into his mind and brought, um, you know, relief and overcame all the many, many stressors uh, of uh, that outside attack that was being experienced. And so if you look at uh, stress equals force over area, the increase the force, the increased force of stressful mindsets increases stress. And then I have to labor to overcome these stressful feelings and experience. And yet when I increase love, that expansive consciousness, I decrease stress according to this formula. So no matter how great the force or the demands are on the self, uh, the, the more I increase love and that denominator of love, the more I will, uh, you know, uh, diminish stress. And so just to allow that love to flow. So incre increase the flow and area of love. And so I would want to now just ask you to reflect on a few questions. I'm going to guide you through a reflection on this. But like we appreciated through this presentation, you know, stress is uh, the outside forces, but also love from within then balances those forces. But despite there being a lot of change in my life, these stressful mindsets also hamper uh, that love. And so to be able to work with that love, I need to also appreciate how these stressful mindsets are interfering with that inner resource of love and I need to choose to let go like um, you know the many patients that I had mentioned had chosen to do and then they could tap into that inner love that inner resource of potential and so forcing life is painful and exhausting but loving life and its opportunities is easier and natural and so can I reflect on what expectations do I have of, of myself or others? As I'm reading this, just think, what expectations do I have of myself or others? Where am I trying to control that which, I, which cannot be controlled to go my way? How can I let go of these a little and witness what happens when I connect to my inner resource of love? And so just hold those thoughts and reflect on them. And I would like to now guide you through a meditation and reflection on these so that we can move uh, forward. So I invite you now 
to become relaxed once again. And as I'm seated here, I just cast my eyes on the beautiful image before me of that ocean so vast and powerful. And the image of that glorious sun And if I have to reflect on the cycles and the patterns in my life, what are some stressful mindsets that create force on the self, that create more stress in my life? What expectations do I have of myself or others? Where am I trying to control that which cannot be controlled to go my way? There may be some repeated mindsets in my life that trip me up. And no matter how much I try to step into opportunities to prosper, these mindsets keep holding me back. So as I skim through the pages of my life, what are some of the dominant expectations? And what do I keep trying to control? And how can I let go of these a little, just a little every day and witness what happens when I connect to my inner resource of love. In this moment now, I choose to let those expectations and control slowly wash away with the waves of the ocean. And I come to that depth of the ocean where there's absolute stillness and calm. And in this moment, I visualize a beautiful light, like that sun before me, just radiating loveful thoughts, tirelessly, pure, powerful, loveful thoughts that create such a beautiful feeling and that expands from inside, just affecting my attitudes, how I see life with wonder and grace, affecting my relationships, my vibration as I walk and move through life. I create atmospheres of love. My body is happy. My mind is happy. My relations flow and I grow. This is living life with purpose and with meaning. And I hold this wonderful, expansive experience of love for as long as I can. This feels so natural, so easy. Letting go of any force 
I choose love. So thank you. So for the next short while, I just want to chat about how do we now grow and develop this inner resource of love that is the antidote to stress? And how do we begin to live from inside out and grow the force of love to counteract the feelings of stress imposed from without. Because if you hold that visual of the many stressors from without trying to smother and put out that light, and then the importance of, of growing that love and living from inside out so that love can counteract the feelings of stress. And so in reflecting on this, um, I. I, I thought that love is about relationships, is it not? So let us begin to explore my relationships in three vital areas of my life that will help expand the area of love and thus reduce stress. So firstly, my relationship with myself. What is my relationship with myself? Do I even have a relationship with myself, with my untouchable self and my higher self, my true self? Like in the example of uh, the patient uh, with brain cancer, you know, can I wait uh, when everything's falling apart to then touch that space? Or can I cultivate pure, authentic self-value and love for the unique being that I am from now? Can I accept the gentle, pure, quiet, powerful, and mighty force of energy that I am and cultivate pure love for this energy of the spirit or the soul that I am? When all facets of my fragile self-made image of who I think I am is being threatened in current day through bodily illness, failed relationships, financial insecurity, loss of meaning and purpose in life, then I have no choice but to get in touch with this energy of the untouchable being that I am. But why wait for them? You know, can I really genuinely begin to like myself? Just as I would want to show another, you know, that I like them and I value their connection by spending time with them. Can I invest my time and energy to get to know and nurture this relationship with the self? An important question, you know, we are always making time for everyone else. And yet how much time do I spend getting to know myself? Can I truly know and encourage my interests? Or is it that I often think, oh, I love to do that, but there's no time. And can I patiently and lovingly support the self in overcoming my defects? Can I accept the whole of me, the yin yang, all parts of myself with acceptance rather than resistance, with the aim to grow, into a stable force or energy? Can I understand the self and the quiet inner fears and insecurities that present itself as a monster to the world uh, with love and patience and encourage and nurture the self as I would a dear friend? If a dear friend is uh, going through difficulty and challenge, experiencing their fears and insecurities, but projecting it outwardly in a different form. You know, I wouldn't chastise or, or be punitive and discouraging, but 
I would really support and help them unpack that situation. So my inner dialogue with the self should be supportive and uplifting and validating of my successes and encouraging after failures, not rigid and suffocating and destructive. And so as I'm sharing, you know, all these thoughts, just look at yourself and, uh, and what is your relationship with the self? Do I believe in myself and my purest intentions? And can I develop that self-trust and connect with that sacred space inside and then share this energy with the world? So genuine self-love can finish the stressful, old, inflexible mindsets based on the fragile sense of self created in the past and can empower me with the inner resource to meet this change. So remember the slide on, on uh, what creates stress, the force of those stressful mindsets. As I generate this genuine, pure love from within, it can finish many of those stressful, old, inflexible mindsets, which were based on uh, very low self-esteem and a fragile sense of self because I had not spent enough time to really get to know who I truly am, but who I thought I was, was dependent on how others saw me and how others um, began to teach me to see me myself but now can I begin to re-educate myself so that I can begin to share who I truly am with the world because I know who I am and so the first relationship is the relationship with the self so that self-love and one needs to anchor oneself in that self-love and then love begets love and you know We've heard this a thousand times, you know, many people have shared this, but can I take the time to not just speak about these things or hear these things, but to really feel that love for the self, to really taste it and savor it and wish for it again and again so that it can begin to do the work that it needs in my life. I really don't think we give ourselves enough time to do this. Uh, I know I don't. And so, you know, uh, paying attention to that relationship of self-love is so important. I know when I'm in difficult situations at work where there are a lot of uh, emotions and chaos in families or a difficult situation with the patient, you know, working with terminally ill patient. It's a highly emotional field. And, uh, and as I have to work in that field, there are times when there's only so much I can do physically. And at that moment, I just tap into that inner resource of love and allow that to flow. And I see the being in front of me also as that untouchable energy, uh, that untouchable spirit and soul. And then this brings the balance. Even in the turmoil within families, this helps families uh, to feel that peace and that love, and they come to balance as well. And so the second relationship that is so important to look at is my relationship with change or challenge in my life. If you remember that, uh, that slide on stress, what causes stress was changes and challenges in my life. And so can I look at my relationship with change and challenge? Is it such that every moment there's change or there's challenge, uh, you know, I feel so stressed and I cannot cope? Or can I change that relationship with challenge and change? And I was just thinking about two of my patients and, and how they use the quality of gratitude uh, to work through uh, their uh, challenge of stage four cancer. And so uh, gratitude is also a form of love. 
And one of them, uh, you know, she started creating a gratitude journal and just appreciating 10 things every morning uh, and every evening, uh, being very grateful for the day. And I know another patient, you know, despite being diagnosed with a terminal illness, he was counting his blessings uh, for the life that he has led and how fortunate he still is when he has to look around the world and what everyone else is going through. And both of these individuals use the energy of gratefulness to cope with change and then lived life with presence and power and possibility. And for me, they were beautiful examples of a very healthy relationship with change and challenge in their life. And so with change and challenge, can I befriend the challenge with lightness and not fear and trepidation? Often when there's change or a challenge that I have to meet, fear sets in and that fear paralyzes you such that one cannot then engage and overcome the stress. And so as I befriend the challenge with lightness and engage in a relationship to understand and find meaning in the challenge or change, uh, I can then come out of that feelings of stress. For example, the, the lady who was journaling every morning, uh, you know, and every evening grateful for her day, um, she then found meaning in her cancer and she, she left so peacefully and so beautifully, really feeling that the cancer was the gift because she grew in those six months like she had never in all her 50 years of life. And even in the master's thesis on dignity that I, I had uh, done with patients with stage four cancers, cancer, I found that those who rose above the challenge with acceptance to find meaning in the change, coped better whilst the others suffered with feelings of stress, suffering, anxiety, depression. And so can I personify the challenge and have a dialogue with the challenge or the change to understand the source of the stress and find meaning in the stressor of your life personally? And you will be quite surprised when you personify the stress uh, or the change or challenge and experiment with this and, and learn from that change or challenge. Because with understanding, will, uh, then will come mercy and love. Uh, and what I will do is at the end of this, I will do a little experiment so one can uh, look at how one can personify the challenge, befriend the challenge, have a cup of tea with the challenge or a change and, and then begin to understand and develop that feeling of mercy and love and acceptance. And really it is love and acceptance of these challenges and changes. Uh, that allows a flowing energy and increases the area, thus decreasing the stress as per that formula. And I was just thinking of another example of uh, uh, a close relative. And uh, they were a strong builder and uh, all their life in control, the man of the house, and yet, with uh, diagnosed with a cancer uh, that, uh, you know, left them without proper digestion and absorption. They had, he had become quite a frail man. And, uh, and he was diagnosed one day and had surgery the next day. And because of that sudden diagnosis and surgery, um, you know, he had never really understood what had happened to him. And every time I would visit, he would repeatedly tell me, why did they butcher me? Why did they butcher me? And for a year, I had tried to explain why the doctors had done what they had. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, he was still stuck in this feeling uh, of being a victim um, uh, and uh, 
and you know, and very very angry and so after a while i had not visited and then my aunt asked me to please visit and this time i thought i'm going to approach it in another way and this time you know as he began to repeat the same things why did they butcher me and uh, you know uh, questioning and feeling so angry with the medical fraternity i then asked him you know um, uh, you know what are you afraid of do you think that because you're not the strong man that you were uh, that you do not exist and i believe that you are more than your body you're this amazing untouchable energy and focus on that and grow that and live life with that energy uh, and as as i shared this with him for the first time after 2 years i saw something happened in his eyes and his eyes began to light up and he asked my aunt to write that down and so with her shaky cursive handwriting she wrote it down and um and he began to practice this that i am a peaceful and powerful soul and as he practiced this um you know oh, within the next few weeks uh, he had come to pass and my aunt had called me to come in see if he had passed away as a medical doctor and when i went to, uh, there at his bedside was this little note i am a peaceful and powerful soul and my aunt called me uh, to the other room a few hours after his passing and she said whatever you had told him changed his entire life's experience in those last two or three weeks he had never been more at peace and so the importance of finding meaning in the challenge and for him he found meaning in finding himself that he was more than his body but this peaceful and powerful energy and so that is an example of developing a relationship with the change or challenge such that i can find meaning in the situation and come to peace and acceptance and power in that moment and the third relationship that one needs to foster to counteract stress and to live from inside out is a relationship with a source of strength and support and uh, loneliness and a lack of love and support and strength worsens stress and if you look around you many today are alone they are they feel like they don't have the support or they don't have a source of strength a source of love uh, to back them and so the third relationship to nurture is that relationship with a source of love and strength and this will help one overcome stress if one develops a relationship with a source of goodness and love call that what you may a higher energy benevolence a power house god and i know in my master's thesis in south africa south africa is a very highly spiritual community and so from all the patients from diverse cultural and spiritual backgrounds uh their anchor was their faith and that was why they were so resilient in dealing uh with facing death they were so resilient um in their dignity they had no expectations of any one or anything but just one strength and no no were there any feelings of lack because they had one support and so in current day you know many of us have expectations of others we have an obsession to control people and situations to receive strength and support from them and it's as if we are constantly plugging into dead cells or batteries of human beings or depleted life circumstances and so accordingly is our state of being our state of mind Uh, based on uh, the state of the world 
And so that is why it is so important to plug into a higher source. This higher energy should be your go-to energy. And it's important to just check, you know, when anything happens, uh, you know, do I feel alone? No, no, no love, no strength, no support. Or can I tap into a source like the ocean, a source that is available of love and strength and support? And so connect and cultivate a nurturing, nurturing relationship with the energy that is benevolent, always, eternally, unconditionally loving, an energy that knows nothing else, radiant, full, powerful, and like the sun is all encompassing, lifting you up and always lifting and uplifting to everyone and everything. And be enveloped and guided by this energy, like the many individuals that I have come to see in life. So let this be your anchor in change. And when you feel fragile, I know for myself, when I'm feeling fragile or, or very stressed, it's so comforting to know that I can take my thoughts to a source of love and support, to a source of strength. And as I do that, the stressor becomes easier to manage. And then, you know, if you look at the quality of love, who benefits first from love but me? As I engage in thoughts of love, it's only I that benefit. And I love this one, slo uh, one slo slogan by Antonia Portia. She says, it matters not who you love, where you love, why you love, when you love, or how you love. It matters only that you love. And so for me, the, the way to really overcome that stress is to grow that love. And especially in these three areas of the self, self-love first. So spend that quality time to begin to know and deeply understand and value this tiniest, most powerful energy that I am. And then to work on understanding the change or challenge, have a relationship with the change or challenge, befriend it, personify it, to begin to understand and have mercy and love for the change and challenge. So it's not a big monster in my life. And most importantly, to cultivate a relationship with that source, uh, that ever loving, unconditional, eternal, ever available energy, such that I don't feel alone and that I need to meet this challenge by myself. And uh, I would like to now guide you through a meditation uh, on this before we can move on to any questions that you may have. So I invite you now, once again, just to relax and totally let go. It's as if everything that's in the canvas of this scene of my life melts away. And all that remains is the tiniest living energy that I am. And I look at this precious light that I am, the untouchable spirit, the untouchable soul, so gentle, and yet so powerful, so beautiful. This is who I am. Do I really know the energy of the spirit that I am, that I uniquely am?
Do I have such faith and love and acceptance for this precious energy that I am? Every day, can I grow this light into this amazing energy, a vital energy, one of 7.8 billion beings of energy. And yet this energy has a unique and powerful purpose. And what is that purpose? What are the challenges of this light? In all the change that may come? What are some of the difficulties or challenges that press my buttons such that a very limited force emerges? Can I personify or befriend my challenge or change? And as I look into the eyes of that challenge or change, what do I see? What is the underlying fear or insecurity? Understanding and finding meaning in this challenge and change, I embrace this challenge. with so much mercy and love in my heart. I know that success will be, I just need to engage in these relationships to understand. And I am supported. I am supported by an amazing, strength and unconditional loving energy that's ever available and one thought away. An energy I can go to in a second. I can plug into that energy and allow the energy of love and healing to flow. And accordingly, that love then flows to me and through me to all facets of my life. And so let me increase this relationship of self-love Let me learn deeply from my relationship with change and let me immerse myself in that relationship with the source, just surrendering all limited energy and overcome with all that power and positivity I then live from inside out with love, power, and possibility. Thank you. Raksha, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm, uh, I'm quite moved, actually. You've covered so much terrain in your conversation tonight, and, and I felt very touched by the way you shared so personally. So, so thank you for that. And some of the key highlights for me, well, um, I love the way that you began by, you know, just outlining how we feel when we're under stress and the impacts that uh, stress has on the body. And I think many of us will know what that feels like. I can't think of anyone in my life um, who hasn't at some point felt acutely stressed and would know those feelings all too well. Um, but I liked also the way you talked about the many external challenges and changes in the world that exert, that exert um, like force on our bodies and then stressful mindsets like, um, like wanting to control what you can't control. Um, and again, these will be ringing true for so many of us, the fear of failure, feelings of inadequacy, um, and then the expectations socially and culturally and, and so on. And, you know, that, um, that uh, great companion perfectionism that doesn't seem to want to let you go. And, and <laughs> Yeah, in that picture, there was a man measuring the size of the grass. <laughs> There you go. I know that one too. A big story for all of us. But then the way that you just moved it all. So, you know, I, I was really with you during the outline of what stress is and, and it's, it's the impact on the body and, and our mindset as well. But then that beautiful shift that had just seemed to come in so naturally. And it was about, you know, when you started talking about love, just a natural energy of the spirit. And um, some of the things that really resonated with me was that, you know, you described it as being inherent and internal and permanently part of me. And, um, and that with that, it actually dispels difficulty and fear. And of course, that, that lovely quote, love is labor lost. Um, it's just mm -hmm. that feeling. And, and as you were speaking, I could start to feel how, how, um, how it actually works, just moving into that orbit of love and you move out of a state of fear. So that living from inside out, um, and then you're saying how that permeates and brings balance to all the domains of myself. Um, yeah, it's a gorgeous. And love the quote from Maya Angelou that, and I can't remember all of it, but that last part about people will remember how they felt when being around you. Um, and uh, you know, isn't that gorgeous as well? And um, and then bringing us into you know a, a conversation or listening to you talk about the outside attack and. Wow, what a giant of a person um, who, you know, the man with a brain tumor, being able to um, put it aside after struggling for 10 years and move into quite a different state um, by that commentary that you spoke with him or the, the dialogue that you had with him. Um, another one that really touched me was that forcing life is painful and exhausting, yet loving life and its opportunities is easier and natural. So that was something that certainly resonated with me. And, and then you finished up with those that aspect of the three relationships, that relationship with myself. And, um, and, you know, can we really invest in ourselves, really truly invest in our pure love and our self-love? Um, and what good examples, you know, everyday things, can I truly love and encourage my interests? Um, or do I just say, look, I haven't got time for them? It's uh, you know, so important to really honor ourselves and, and can I accept the whole of me, the yin and yang, with acceptance rather than resistance? And uh, so some gorgeous points coming through about self-love and how we might grow that. And then um, I was kind of anticipating the next one would be relationship with others, but you moved into relationship with change and challenge. And I felt that, I thought that was just fantastic what you were saying there. Like, you know, can I respond differently with gratitude to work through a challenge and start to see a challenge as befriending it and, and personify it? Um, so that, um, you know, can I befriend the challenge with lightness and engage in a relationship with, with it so that I don't sort of get into those stress attack states. Um, mm -hmm. so it, was, uh, it was very insightful. Thank you for that one. And um, I also like the way you sort of casually said, you know, have a cup of tea with the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sort of makes it so every day and so, and so accessible. Um, and then, of course, this lovely one that you brought in at the end there, a relationship with a source of strength and love and support and, and you gave us that opportunity to call that one whatever we wanted to a higher energy god the divine benevolence um, but to be enveloped and guided by this being and um, and that I can bring benefit from thoughts of love and really it matters only that you love so 
I, I started to see how very much um, looking at overcoming stress from an angle of love versus force was just such a lovely way of, um, of managing what looked like um, a huge list of, <laughs> of impact that stress has and just such an easy equation to turn that around and that is just to, to bring out the love that's there, that's permanently with inside ourselves. So thank you very much. A, a gorgeous talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we do have some questions. It helps it up amazingly. <laughs> I, I, was, I was enjoying it so much. It was, uh, yeah. There's some lovely, very deep points, and I'm sure all our viewers will have found something in their many little treasures that will resonate and, um, and that they'll take away with themselves as well. And look, we do have a few questions. So um, are you up for a, a couple of questions? Yes. Yes. Um, this first one is, how does one know if the love being demonstrated is actual love and not manipulation? Um, you know, uh, the aspect we spoke of not being, you know, I can't control certain things. And, uh, you know, others uh, expression of love for you and whether it's real or manipulative love, that does not matter. But what matters is my intention and my love, you know, like that saying at the end, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who, what, why you love, but just love. So when I love, it flows through me and I feel that love first. And so for me, it's more important that I am genuine in everything that I do, whether others are that or not is the effect on them, but what I do is the effect on me. And so, so it doesn't matter because you're not waiting for that love because you are love. So it's not, if it's a false love, it doesn't matter. If it's a true love, it doesn't matter because you're so anchored in self-love. Yeah. That's, yeah. Mm, so that's that first relationship, isn't it? The love. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then there's, you can also uh, take up the, and I know you mentioned you thought the second one would be love, develop a relationship with others, but change and challenge uh, covers others, because uh, sometimes they can be, uh, the person can be the challenge, or the person can be the change, and so change and, cha that relationship with change and challenge encompasses relationships with people. And, uh, and then the third relationship could also support in this, uh, in this situation, you know, if I'm relying on a higher source for that love, so whether the other being is offering me a manipulative love or not, it does not matter because I am whole and complete and full in self-love and in that love that I experience from an ever available pure divine love. Mm, it's lovely. Yes. Here's another one here coming through is what's the difference between power and force? Mm, so the difference between power and force. So um, for me, sometimes when I use the word force, uh, I also think of it as power, uh, but, um, uh, but a beautiful energy. Uh, but the force we were referring to in today's talk was, uh, you know, the stressors. Uh, that uh, that try and put out the light and suffocate the soul because I'm sure when you felt uh, stressed there was a deep feeling of suffocation I need to hide it in a little rabbit hole or <laughs> I need to run away from the world when one feels very stressed and so so yet if at that moment I choose the force of love then that ripples out powerfully and diminishes the darkness. So, so it's a little bit like a Marvel movie or <laughs> DC movie, but, but each one, the superhero of love, whilst um, you know, uh, there may be these external forces. So it's how you use the word force versus love for me. Uh, yeah, but, but in today's talk, we were referring to uh, the stressors. Um, because scientifically stress was force over area. So that's why we were referring to that as force. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. 
No, I got it. I got it. And uh, there's a lot in that one too. Look, um, Raksha, here's one that I think is coming to you. And it's an interesting question. And it's only three three words. It's a very big question. Um, and in the context of someone who, you know, who's spent um, so many years of your life working with people who are dying, the question is, what is life? What is life? Mm. To me, life is uh, being in touch with that inner world, because uh, the outer world is so fragile that, uh, you know, whilst we have to live in the outer world, uh, can I really love that inner world and allow that inner world to heal and support the other outer world? And when I live with purpose, that is life. And for me, purpose is staying in that inner world and being in touch with that inner world and letting that inner world just flow to create my outer world. And, uh, and so no matter where I am, what I'm doing, uh, if I stay in that inner space, I live. But uh, when I get lost in the outer world, I am crushed. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not that I'm able to maintain that the entire day, but, um, you, know, you know, when I touch that space inside, uh, life is beautiful and magical and precious and every second is experienced. You know, that expansive energy of love that we spoke of. But when I'm, um, you know, uh, when I'm, you know, really constantly reacting and responding externally, uh, just with my many acquired identities and roles, uh, then it takes a lot and uh, I'm exhausted at the end of the day. And that's not life for me. <laughs> what is life is really to, to spend uh, time in action, but uh, for, with my, my um, eye turned inward on, on that inner being that I am and connecting to a higher being and offering that as, an, as, a, as a conduit. Uh, in the world. So I love also being a conduit, you know, um, there's a beautiful um, slogan, you know, in the Brahma Kumaris, it, it means Karan Karavan Har, it means, uh, you know, do but be inspired by the one who is making you do. And I love that. So, so whilst I have to work and walk and, and, uh, you know, I had to put my phone on flight mode for this session because I already had received about five calls from patients, one of which had passed away this morning. So, um, so you know, there's a lot happening. But uh, if I can hold that power of who I am in everything and take support from a strength uh, that is immeasurable and uh, amazing, uh, then I live, you know, and, and I'm not overcome by the stress or because, you know, one could look at my life as a stressful life, but, but it's an opportunity for me to share the love that I am and the love from a divine with uh, others in the world. So for me, that is life. Ooh, well, that Daddy Janki summed it up. <laughs> Daddy Janki summed it up. Yeah, Daddy Janki, you know, our, our administrative head, uh, you know, who left the body, passed away last year. I loved her slogan was, who am I? Who do I belong to and why am I here? And I think I live by that. You know, who am I? Who do I belong to and why am I here? And for me, this is life. Yes, yes, yes. And what a remarkable person that Daddy Janky was as well. Yeah. Look, here's a comment coming through that I'd like to read to you. Thank you, ladies. An extremely lovely talk, a most wonderful and deep meditation. Um, you are truly a deep and sincere, warm and powerful guide and leader. Thank you so very much. So there we go. It's a, a comment coming through uh, of appreciation and gratitude, Raksha, for what you've shared this evening. If we've Thank got time for one last question, let's see if we can do it. When my father died, he struggled for at least three years. He really didn't want to die. He was uncomfortable, but thanks to modern medicine, um, his, yet his pain was from within mm -hmm. his consciousness. I could sense that he hadn't reconciled something within himself and the way he led his life, and he died like this. You will have seen a lot of dying as a palliative care physician. How can I die in a loveful way? For me, um, you know, uh, I practice dying every day. 
So, so um, you know, every day I ask myself, you know, if this were the last, uh, am I at peace? And so, so I'm not waiting for should anything happen. You know, they say, if you die before you die, you will never experience death, you know. And so, so can I, uh, you know, complete and bring closure to all domains of my life? Actually, every morning I check my relationship with my body, my mind, wealth, relationships. I do that audit every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because uh, if today is my last, I want to know that, you know, I am in harmony, I am in balance, uh, I am ready to fly out of this body, you know, uh, with ease, um, because things are happening suddenly with COVID, you know, we've had many individuals doing living wills. Uh, because COVID was just, uh, you know, in many parts uh, of the world, you know, was so sudden and such so many deaths. And so, yeah, so, so to prepare for that, live life and uh, bring balance in all aspects of yourself and don't wait for the last moment to do that. You know, some individuals haven't spoken to others for 40 years and, and you know, so, so check what would pull the mind uh, when I have to leave? So that, um, and then what characteristic possibly, you know, your dad was too proud to speak about it. So, so check yourself deeply, you know, uh, have no pride about doing this inner work so that I can easily let go and be free and peaceful at that moment. It sounds like if yes. you live a loveful life, then you'll, Die a loveful death. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. 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 Look, Arasha, we've come to the end of our time, not the end of the questions, but to the end of the time. There's still some lovely comments coming in. Thank you, Raksha, so much for your talk. It's been very inspiring. And I know there's more comments of gratitude and appreciation there as well. Um, I'm wondering if we could close um, just with a short one minute meditation or two minute meditation and then I'll come back yes. and do the wrap up would that be okay are you happy okay. to do that yes okay. yes that's good okay so once again just allow the self to become totally relaxed and as I focus on that beautiful point on the center of the screen I allow my consciousness and my thoughts to just go deep within that beautiful light before me. And as I step into this peaceful space, nothing else matters but the precious living light that I am. And I choose to live now with love and peace and power. And in this moment, I just immerse myself in that ocean of love, absorbing all the waves of love that wash over me like I would in the physical ocean, I accept these waves of love and allow them to penetrate deep within my soul. I am loved. I am lovable. And with this energy, I flow, meeting the many opportunities in life, because I know that within me, I have all the resources to bring balance and harmony to every change, to every challenge. 
with this deep faith in myself, in that companion, and in every scene of change and challenge, I grow and I flow beautifully. Life is my teacher and I choose to live from inside out, bringing a balance to all that life shares with me. Om Shanti, thank you. Raja, a big, big thanks from all of us. That was a, a truly inspiring and insightful talk. And, um, and more than anything, thank you so much for sharing the love. It was gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and it's wonderful being with all of you in Australia. <laughs> yes, it's lovely having you back again um, <laughs> online. But uh, let's see, in the future, it may be in person, and that will be equally beautiful. Um, viewers, thanks for your questions. They were very thought-provoking, and um, and I know that you would easily have found um, some very valuable answers and treasures in the way that Raksha responded to them. Now, look, you might like to browse our online bookshop. It's Eternity Inc., and it's full of an online range of books on, excuse me, on um, on self empowerment and spirituality, and it's always at not for profit prices. If you'd like to, to subscribe to Open Your Eyes to the Universe to receive monthly updates, then please email us at special.events at au.brahmakumaris.org. And finally, I'd like to tell you about our next episode of Open Your Eyes to the Universe. Dr. Grace Charles Lopez will join us, um, and that'll be on Saturday evening, the 26th of June, starting at six o'clock. And her topic is Deciphering Truth. So who deceives you and how easily are you deceived? There is an exceptionally fine line between truth and falsehood. And how do you know when someone is not being sincere? So this episode will focus on the importance of deciphering truth through the development of a powerful tool, that being the power of discernment. So she'll be with us again on Saturday, the 26th of June at six o'clock AEST. So until then, take care. And until we meet again, may your days be filled with love and ease. Om Shanti.